Welcome to the Win Make Give podcast. Chad Himes here. And before I bring my partner in crime into the conversation, I want to remind you of all the podcasts we have in the Win Make Give podcast network, because maybe you're looking for something with a little twist. Of course, here on Win Make Give, we discuss health, wealth, leadership, and how to leave a legacy. Bob and I get the pleasure of interviewing amazing people and are often joined by Ben Kinney himself. Over on the 15-point plan, Jalene Snell and I get to talk to you about health, energy, and happiness level. You need a kick there? Come join us. Clint Swindoll leads the conversation on Tell Me Something Good, where he's going to put a ray of sunshine in your day through lessons every week, and he's going to share some of the good things going on around the world that you should know about. And if you are a real estate agent or maybe building a sales business, you might want to check out the Built How podcast where we've been interviewing people about how they built their sales business to the level that they have so you can do what we like to call R&D, rip off and duplicate. That's That's right. right. That's right. And there he is. You heard him, my friend, as we're here on season three of Win May Give. Bob Stewart, good to speak with you, my friend. Chad, I feel like I haven't talked to you in ages. Even though I see you every every week, we haven't gotten together and recorded uh, an interview or, for a little while, right? And I don't know how these things drop. Sometimes this could be the first thing anybody hears. And they're like, what is this guy talking about? This is season one or uh, episode one and, and they're there. But uh, so it's good to be back. It's good to be back. Um, I'm actually really excited about our, our guest today for a couple of reasons. Uh, I was raised by a single mom that went really high in the corporate world. And I think like dealt with so many issues that today we're talking more about, right? My mom came up, Susan, uh, our guest is here and she can hear us obviously, but came up in a world in in the hardware world where she was an executive and and every corner of the building was filled by men. And my mom was one of the first women to, to really raise up to a high level, executive level in the hardware industry in the United States. And so I'm, I'm fascinated by this issue of like diversity and, and having different viewpoints in the workplace. And so I'm excited to, to bring Susan on today, Chad. Super excited. Well, there you, there you go, Bob. You've already dropped the, the who we're talking to today. Now, of course, our audience is probably smart enough that they read the show notes or see the title and, and it's given away. Yet, if you hadn't, then you don't know. Yes, we are being joined today by Susan Brady. Susan, welcome to the Win Make Give podcast. Well, thanks for having me, you guys. It's really fun. We are so excited to have you here. We were actually discussing before, folks. I want you to understand these amazing guests that we bring, they're listening as well. Susan was sharing a story with us just before we hit record about something that was said in one of our episodes past that has helped her. And we know that today she's going to share, oh, a dozen things that are going to help you as long as the student is ready to hear it because the teacher is now here. Now, Susan, other than what Bob has just said and what I've just said, they don't know you. So would you do me the honor of introducing yourself to our audience so they know who you are the way you want them to know, Susan? Well, as of like two weeks ago, I'm a best-selling author now. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, I'm the Deloitte Ellen Gabriel Chair for Women in Leadership and the CEO of the Simmons University Institute for Inclusive Leadership. I'm a mom of two spirited young women and uh, two crazy Portuguese water dogs. And um, one of my hobbies is catching sunsets. And uh, I was raised by a single father. Uh, so that's a whole story. Uh, but I'm psyched to be here. I'm really looking forward to talking to you about leadership and um, arriving and thriving, which is what my latest is about. Okay. So I, I, first of all, let, let's get the plug out of the way. Recently titled bestseller, give everybody the book that we're going to be covering some of the things that are probably lessons from within that book so they can go get their copy of it, which we'll have the link in the show notes for them. Susan, what, tell us about the book. Let's start there and then we'll get to these yeah. exciting sunsets. Uh, so it's my fourth book. It's a collaborative work. Uh, my co-author is Janet Fowdy, who's the executive chair of Deloitte US and the president of Simmons University, Lynn Perry Wooten. Uh, and I wrote Arrive and Thrive, um, Seven impact- Impactful Practices for Women Navigating Leadership. Don't let the title fool you. The seven impactful practices are really for everyone. And uh, it's 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 really fun to talk about them and to be on my own journey of arriving and thriving and engage with uh, anyone who wants to talk about it, about what this is about. 
All right. And we're going to definitely dive into those seven. So get ready, folks, with your pen, your paper. And of course, uh, Susan's going to fill us in on what those seven are that you'll want to read more in the book. Susan, catching sunsets, that, that's a hobby? I mean... I'm making it happy because you know what? I worked, <laughs> you know, the most, one of the most relieving uh, times, moments in the last 20 years of my life was listening to a speaker at a women's leadership conference who was a C- sitting CEO of a Fortune 500 company. She got that the question from the audience, like, what do you do for hobbies? And she bent really close to the microphone and she's like, I ski and I knit and I garden. And what else did she say? Oh, I'm a swimmer. And then she whispered when I was in college. And I was like, (laughs) that's awesome. She's like, really? If you want to be a CEO or an executive leader in business, this was pre-pandemic. So maybe times are changing. Um, You know, she was like, I have enough time for my kids, my, my husband and my work. And and the reason it was relieving to me is because I had so many expectations of how I should show up in the world, including a very impressive roster of hobbies that I was, of course, going to be excelling at. And I was excelling at nothing um, other than, you know, basically, you know, keeping up with my my kids in a way that felt good to me. You know, it's loaded for me since I was a single, I was raised by a single father. Being a mom is really important to me. And, you know... Um, leading and making cool things happen in the world. Um, I'm lucky because a lot of my interests align with my day job and it creates for a little workaholism. But anyway, so yeah, so so I love uh, watching sunsets. I catch them wherever I am in the world when I travel and um, uh, I'm good at it. It calms me down. <laughs> All right. And I know, Bob, uh, hang on, Bob, because I know you've got a bunch of questions I'm letting you gather. I just want to check, uh, Susan, do you live somewhere that you get good sunsets? Because... We have a story of, of Ben, and Bob might have been ready to tell this too. We have the story of Ben has shared where he was on the east coast of the country sitting on the water, waiting to watch the sunset over the water because, well, <laughs> he's not so smart sometimes because we live on the west coast where the sun actually does set over the water. Yeah. Uh, do you live somewhere nice for sunsets? I, if Ben was here, I would say you're enough in your matter, you matter dude. Like, that's a rookie <laughs> sunset watcher. <laughs> I've done it uh, myself. I got my compass all turned around. So um, I grew up on the island of Martha's Vineyard, believe it or not, all year mm. round and um, caught a few sun- sunsets, but it's an East Coast island. Um, my best sunsets have been on the West Coast. I, I My favorite now, I have a, um, I have a, a, a home that I visit in, in Tampa and I go to the sunsets there, like Clearwater sunsets are pretty spectacular. So They really uh, are. I live yeah, there yeah. a while. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really? that's interesting. You, right? you, you know this sunset, Chad. I you know, know the, the Clearwater, the Clearwater sunset. sunset. I, I lived Absolutely. on Clearwater Beach for uh, for a year of my life as well. All right, so let's put the sun. Hold, hold, hold on, I want to ask you a question about Su- Susan. You said something in there that I, I just you basically brought up this idea that like you heard this lady talking about needing to have you know the the roster, you know the the resume, right? And and the bottom of the resume always has. You know, all the, the fun hobbies. And it, but basically that was the world was telling you, you need to have all these hobbies too. Right. And, and you hearing this powerful lady up there kind of admitting that, that, you know, she wasn't able to have this roster of hobbies. Yeah. These were other people's expectations, the world's expectations of you. Can you just, can we just start for a second by talking about, like the weight of carrying around all these expectations. I think for a woman, especially in a, in a, you know, in, in the business world, like, can you just talk about a, addressing those, those expectations that, that we're constantly faced with every day that we feel like, man, if I'm not living up to it here, then I'm not good enough. Right. Like, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you face that? So first of all, I love that you backed us up and, and, and brought us right here. Thank you for that. Uh, the language I use for this is deeply held beliefs that no longer serve us. And I'm always on the lookout for deeply held beliefs that I might be unconscious about. So I, I kind of sometimes take an inventory. If I, and your trigger, your, you know, the thing that tips me off is what shoots me into shame. So if I feel I'm not good enough, or if I feel like I'm not doing it right, is there something about that belief that's holding a standard that isn't realistic or is it something or something that I just, you know, I bought into, whether I consciously bought into it or I was taught it as a kid and I don't even remember learning it, um, that just no longer serves me. And then it's, 
up to me, thank you, God, because I'm an adult, to let it go, right? And so what beliefs, what values, what kind of, uh, I guess, buffers in the road do I want to hold myself uh, accountable to? Uh, it does actually go right to one of the practices of the book about that includes well-being. You know, we get to define what well-being means for us over the course of our lifetime, and it's going to change. Um, as we grow and as we mature. So I, I, well, I, I constantly, Susan, you mentioned it. How old are your daughters, by the way? So I have a, an uh, almost 20 year old and an almost 17 year old. Okay. So, so you've been able to experience the, them growing up. I have a four to six year old and I'm a 14 year old, but he lives with his mom. So I'm really, you know, learning a lot more from raising my four and six year old. And a lot of times I'm, it's me applying these, these beliefs that I have that I don't even know where they came from. I mean, I, I guess I was raised with them, right? But I, I start to apply them to my children. And then I, I look, as I'm applying to my children, I'm like, wait a minute. Like, do I even believe that? Is it like, why am I making my child do that thing? It's some, I start to, I'm starting to discover these beliefs as I'm starting to apply them to my children. That's, that's like the checkpoint for me, right? Did you, like raising daughters, did you see these things you were applying to your kids and go, wait a minute, where did that even come from? Oh, oh, big time. I mean, and it's loaded for women. You kind of hinted at this, right? So the expectations about, uh, you know, if you wake up woman or if you wake up woman of color, you know resilience and you know resilience because there's all sorts of messages that we get. And there are messages for guys too. Um, about who we should be in the world and, you know, the shoulds, the shouldn'ts, the supposed tos, those we have to be really careful of, especially when we dish them out to others or when we hear them in our own mind. Um, are your two little ones girls? No, they're two, I have two boys. You have two boys. Okay. I got, you know, I got the girl who's your daughter grown up. I got the 21 year old. You got the 21 year old. I'm in yeah. your world. Look, it's, I mean, for any gendered uh, kid, it's a tall order these days to be a parent because, you know, we had the luxury, I'm guessing, I think I'm a little older than you guys, but we had the luxury of um, growing up in a world where we weren't um, digital natives, really, like fluent digital yeah. natives. And so right. we, here's the thing, this is the fundamental difference between raising kids today, even, even kids that are like 20 is um, we took for granted the simplicity of being able to be wherever we were. And the fact that our kids are being raised in a world where they're not, they're constantly exposed to what they're not, what they should be, what they shouldn't be, what other people are, right? The contrast in their brain is constant. Um, and it's just not, a, it's, it's, more, it's a more complicated time to parent. So we have to root our kids and their worthiness early and in their own narrative. You know, kids' narrative is what they will feel about themselves when they grow, grow up, you know? And then, and then my joke is with my kids, well, you know, no matter what, um, they're going to blame me for whatever they feel is yucky and then go to therapy anyway. So, you know, I've got like pretty good margin for error. <laughs> you know, wait a minute. Right? That sounds like my daughter. You've got that figured out perfectly. <laughs> yeah, it's, normal. it's just normal. normal. It is. And it's interesting. My daughter made a conscious choice as she was growing up. It wasn't anything. Believe me, I'm a social media. I used to train it and teach people how to use it. And I'm on there. And sometimes my wife is like, can we not share all of that? Right. My daughter has purposefully chosen. She does not have a profile that she uses on any of these things. She stays off everything. Now, that doesn't mean she doesn't sit there and watch TikTok to pass the time or watch YouTube, but I, she's not engaging and interacting and living in that social media world. And it's interesting to see uh, some of the differences that come from that and then some of the things that maybe she's missing out on, which is the continued relationships they can bring. I, I think I'm a slow adapter. I mean, really slow. Like Instagram, I've been reluctant for a long time. And then finally, um, last week, you know, my co-author Janet met Ryan Reynolds, sent him our book, and then he posted to 43 million people a picture with all of our Instagram. Is, are they handles? Get I don't out. know what it's called. Yes. Get out. Were, <laughs> and then, of course, my now kids you are, know why you're on the bestseller list. Right, right, right. <laughs> Very sweet. We made it even before that, but but Ryan Reynolds. I mean, even I, I'm even like, wow, maybe I should do Instagram. I mean, he does it, you know. So I, I feel like my kids, oh, by the way, are like Blake Lively <laughs> as the book in her home. I was like, asked Ryan. They were like all about Blake. I'm like, yeah, wait, don't get too excited. Here. But now I, I realize that like social media is. I need to think of it as a friend instead of a foe, <laughs> you know? Uh, I'm getting there, Chad. Maybe you can coach me. 
And, and Susan, we'll, we'll take that connection to Ryan any day if you want to have him, you know, contact us. We'd love to have him on the <laughs> podcast and I'd love to send him my book. So uh, let, let's get into this. Let's dive into the seven, uh, the seven in your points in your book that you really cover so we can then go a little bit deeper. Obviously, I want to hear also about some of the challenges and they might come out in the seven and they might come out after as we talk about them. Some of the challenges of being a woman, right? Mm -hmm. In this world specifically, we've got a very large audience of women that are out there that are listening to the podcast. And I know they'd love to hear somebody saying, hey, it's okay, ladies. And I'm going to also ask you that before we get off this call, you speak specifically to the men because there are some of us who kind of need that reminder or need that push in the right direction. And we have a large male audience, of course, that are sitting there saying, how do I, you know, work in this world better? I think I'm good at it yet. How do I be more accepting? But let, let's start with those seven points that you guys have in the book and let's go through there. Uh, all right. So uh, there are seven practices. In and of themselves, the practices aren't necessarily original because there's books and books and books on each of these practices. It, sure. you know, in, in theory, um, and uh, and then the, but the but the compilation of them is, I think, really helpful. And then what we did is we it's a distillation uh, and our own wisdom and stories. And then we interviewed like twenty five sitting CEOs, which is really cool. Most of them women. Uh, so uh, number one, investing in your best self. That's uh, really where most of my uh, expertise lies. And, I'll, and I also believe it's the one practice in the book that if you don't work it before the other six, you're going to be suboptimally practicing the other six. Mm. Uh, number two, embracing authenticity. Number three, cultivating courage. Number four, fostering resilience. Number five, inspiring a bold vision. Number six is creating a healthy team environment. And last but not least, committing to the work of an inclusive leader. So those are our seven impactful practices for women navigating leadership. Which one do you want to dive in? Like, I'm going to guess you're going to go back to number one when I say which I always one should want to, I always want to talk about in. best so, health. I want to hear about some team building stuff in there. I want to hear about how you develop resiliency. I, I, I mean, because people say to me, you know, how do I get that grit thing that people talk about? Love to hear those things from you. I, I saw Bob's hand quickly writing over there. Let's go back to point number one, which is developing yourself. And yeah, you've got to start there, you're saying. Yeah. So let me define best self for you guys, the way we, the way we think about it. It is when your, uh, your strengths and talents, those are both you know, you're sort of the characteristics you were born with that make you make it special in you, combined with the things that 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 you've learned over time. Those are your strengths and talents. Um, when those come together with where you feel called to be in service of others, and when those come together with where you feel joy and vitality, uh, I think you are in your best self zone. The surround, so it's like three concentric circles for our listening audience, like picture yep. strengths and talents overlapping with where I feel called to be in service of others and where people are like, yeah, man, you're great at that. Thank you. Um, and then where you get jazzed because there are, there are strengths that we have where we might be asked to, to, to be of value to others that actually deplete us. So, so I'm talking about what fills our cup, but what makes us where we lose track of time. So that's you're talking one of those Venn diagrams. That's what they're called, right? The Venn diagrams, the three circles. And then we're looking yeah. for that section right there in the middle where they all overlay each other and come together yeah. and say, be here. Yep. So the call to action is to number one, get to know who you are when you are at your best. And, you know, for, you know, I Velcro to her, uh, like she is your most important um, love, you know, I, the, the thing that I think both that all genders do is we overlook what lights us up and then we get really disappointed in everybody around us. Um, you know, I don't know how that works like that, but it's like a two-step, you know? So for some reason we put it on other people to allow us to know where we are when we're at our best and allow us to be there. And, you know, we have a role in this, um, a big role in this. Number one, to identify it. And number two, to find uh, ways to step into it more fully. So um, there's lots of ways to identify and to invest in your best self, getting to know. And then we offer lots of cool tools in the book. Um, but the but the but the hard part actually isn't getting to know her. The hard part is returning to her when you get kicked out because life invariably happens. Uh, and so, what I love working with leaders, um, particularly men, uh, about is 
knowing and paying attention to when you get triggered in a way where you are decidedly not actually in your best self. By the way, when we lead from our best self, we are no better or worse than another human being. We hold ourselves in warm regard. We feel respect for our gifts and talents. And at the same time, we feel respect for the person that we're with. So it's not like we're jockeying for like, if I feel good, I, therefore you guys can't be as good. Or if I don't feel as good, it's because you guys are better. It's like we get to be awesome at the same time. And uh, particularly for women, it's a hard thing to wrap our mind around because there's just only... Um, there's, there's not very many of us in the workplace. Okay. Take a, Can I ask you a question about that, Susan, yeah. about that very specific. There's not very many of us in the workplace. I, yeah. I read something recently about, or I don't, I can't remember what this was, but it was this idea that because there's not many positions in the workplace for women, sometimes there's this like propensity to, to guard that. If I'm a woman in that position, I'm like, well, there's not very many of these for me. I, I got to make sure there's not other women coming up under me that might yeah. take this position for me. Do you see that in the workplace? This idea that because there's not a lot of these positions for us, like we got to kind of protect them from others who might, yeah. like, is that a thing? Well, yeah, it's scarcity, right? So yeah. it's um, when there's a lot of something for certain people, and there's not a lot of something for other people. The, uh, the othered people feel like they got to fight over it, the little that's there. And so the paradigm that we want to shift, of course, is that there's plenty to go around. Uh, the challenge is that not only do underrepresented populations sometimes feel like, oh, there's only tolerance for so many of us in one room. The dominant population, in this case, what we're talking about in the workplace, uh, in, in, you know, men in power, um, don't, last I checked, people in power don't like to give up their power. Um, so, so there's that duality that's a reinforcing loop, um, which when we start to look at, which I, you know, we can go here, but, you know, when I, when I, work with executives or, or leaders of organizations who want to create more gender diversity in their teams because they know that their businesses are going to actually produce better results if they have more, 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 more identities, more difference, more unique points of view. Uh, when they want to do that and they ask me how, we have to make room for equally qualified candidates for the people who are representing a different identity to come forward. Uh, and that's that's part of the challenge, right? Part of the challenge. Oh, yeah. If it was I'm easy, so, everybody would have done it by now. <laughs> I'm so confused over here. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm, and I'm going to pull your authentic part here, right? And I'm just going to, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you just like an audience member. And that's what we love about doing the podcast. Bob and I get to talk to some amazing people. I'm so confused. Why are there limited opportunities for women? Is I mean, what job can't a woman do? do and, and and is it just me saying wait a minute I, I i just don't see it are there that many people that are saying woman you can't do this job because right i'm, I'm so confused yeah so uh chad thank you for admitting your confusion about this so look the workplace was not built uh for for women the sure it wasn't back then i get that <laughs> Right. So here's the dilemma that it really holds. And what we see, um, I was asked by a, uh, the, a chairman of a company if the sole reason why we don't see more women in leadership is because women can have babies, but men can't. And I said, well, I said, that would actually be right. But for the fact that even women who don't choose to be mothers also find that their own advancement is stagnated. And so what happens is, is that people tend to um, promote um, and Draw, are drawn to people like them. And so okay. start with a dominant group of people, let's just say a bunch of white guys, right? Who are you, who, who see young, you know, you see young, I'm Sam, I see young Joe. Joe reminds me of me at a younger age. Joe's got that same characteristic. He's got the it factor. I'm going to take Joe under my wing. This is, I mean, it's been referred to, um, you know, sometimes as the good old boy network. Uh, that's the, the challenge is that because we're drawn to people who are like us, and because we feel most comfortable with people who are like us, we're apt to, when we get to power, connect with, promote, talk about behind their back positively people who are like us. And so what we have to do is start to create 
semi-artificial systems for sponsorship for um, those who aren't in positions uh, that represent the majority who aren't ha- don't have identity. So, like, so you know, uh, women need to be sponsored too purposefully, which creates an entirely confusing role for men. So let me just get this straight, you guys. Um, You are, because I just want you to really understand the task at hand. You are being told to figuratively put your arm around the highest potential woman, right, uh, in your organization and bring her along, right? While at the same time, you know, your legal department and your HR department is giving you all these rules to what to say and not to say so that you know, she's not offended and so that you don't cross a boundary and, 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 uh, it's a confusing time to be a guy at work. That's my take. It's a confusing time. And, uh, we're all learning the way here, which is actually fair. Yeah. I, I'm, my mind just blown. I mean, I'm, I'm just sitting here and Bob and then I'll let, I'm just, I don't understand this concept, right? This, this well, is you so, can understand, Chad, you can understand that there's like a system in place that kind of just by its nature and yeah, by, the way, by its nature, Susan, because like a thousand years ago or, or 10,000 years ago, biologically, I would have looked around and said, I want to be buddies with that guy. He looks like me. He's in my tribe. He's right here. Right. Like bring him close. And, and look, I, so I think that like, we, should we feel bad about that? Like, should people in a position <laughs> no, of look so conscious of it? So Chad, conscious, let me yeah. put it to you this way. Okay. So I already told you guys, I was raised by a single father. Yeah. I was really close to my step father and my mom too. My stepfather was, um, uh, actually had a great career in business. My, my, my biological father who raised me did not. Um, I gotta tell you guys, I exited my childhood home being raised by a single father. I mean, I say I was raised by wolves, my coaches, my mentors, my teachers, mostly men, my primary parent, man. And I thought the world was going to be the same for me. Like, why would I, I didn't even think anything of it. I just, you know, went into the world and did my thing. You know, I'm tenacious. I'm, I've got a lot of energy, as you can see. I'm an extrovert. You know, I'm willing to work hard. I'm smart. So I go into the world and I get jobs and I start doing my thing. And I, you know, look to my right and look to my left. And there's mostly guys around me. That's cool. I can keep up. And then, um, not until like my mid thirties, because I was all about, I wasn't about women's leadership. I was about leadership. Like, we're all leaders, we're all humans. And then I was smacked with the fact um, that I bought into meritocracy and it actually didn't apply. And here's why. My tenacity, which was looked at for my male counterparts as, oh, he's, he's a go-getter. My tenacity was referred to as, she thinks it's all about her. <laughs> And, 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 and so what happened was the deeply held beliefs, some stereotypes of, uh, and assumptions made about my behavior were actually attributed to different drivers because I was a woman. And I, 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 I totally buy into that. I, I and I'm my getting angry over work. here. I'm getting angry over here. That, that right. you should. it shouldn't, <laughs> right? And, and, and I don't get it because maybe it's just the way I think and I'm not. Right, I don't get that. There's some guy out there that looks at you and looks at Bob. I'm looking at both of you on the screen and says, "Well, Bob's better because he's a guy, right?" And that just makes no. But that's sense not. My brain. But that's not what they're saying. They're saying, you know, Bob's Bob's a hardworking guy and he's providing for his family. And gosh, you know, um, he's doing a great job. Susan, gosh, she's she's just out for herself. So that is a narrative. It's it's not, and it actually really really impacted me. For me to the way to, this is going, uh, Susan, I'm ready to trade Bob for you as my co-host in a heartbeat. I mean, uh, it's not all about you. It's right. You're you're sharing. You're giving. You're. You're caring, you're helpful. And yeah, Bob's more like me in the sense that he's a white guy. I'm a white guy. Sorry, you know, that wasn't by choice. But that doesn't mean you're not more qualified for the opportunity. And it just makes me angry. We might have a future together. I, you know, I could think like having a woman's voice in your mix might, 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 might be cool for your, for your listeners. And that's why we attempt to bring more women guests. But what can we, okay, look, we're going to get into a whole bunch. I know Bob's got, I'm just angry and I want to do something about this, right? In season three, Bob and I said, We were going to focus on people that are making an impact, people that are making a difference, and people that are helping us make more money. That was what the win, make, give concept was going to be for season three. You're making an impact. You're making a difference in this world of this. Look, I'm a guy. I'm a white guy. Help me, because I don't see it this way, but 
you, what can I do to now help advance this? Can I, yeah. can I just, uh, let me take a quick stab here. I, I don't think that you have to be that person. I think you just have to acknowledge that person exists, right? That this, that this exists. It's real. Chad, so what can I do about it though? Yeah, he exists, but yeah, right. so does evil. I mean, right? And sure. <laughs> Susan, <laughs> what do we start to do now? Okay. So, you know, I know, you know, it's like, first of all, for all the men listening to the podcast, I hope you're enjoying this because this is like one of the more honest conversations I've had about all of this. Uh, look, what we're really asking is what does allyship mean, right? In a world sure. where you uh, woke up white male, which is a unearned privilege. So if you've heard those terms, right? I, you know, we're not in person, but I'm almost, I'm just shy of 5'11", 5'10 and a half. And I hear some of my more petite friends talk about how they get scared at night walking to their car. I've never really gotten scared. Men don't pray in that way because I'm a bigger person. I'm a bigger human. You know what I mean? Um, that's a privilege that I didn't earn. I woke up from like Viking people. I have like, I'm like come from a cast of giants. It just <laughs> happens to be that I'm a tall, taller woman than the average woman. But that's my um, an example of unearned privilege. You woke up white guy. So what is our job? Me being tall, you being white guy. Um, our job is to be aware that not everybody got the same advantage. And then to look for stories that we make up, um, conscious or unconscious, about people because of what they are or what they're not. And so the first step in the allyship game is to start thinking about your thinking. Um, the best way to do this that I know that I, I love to tell all leaders is um, the uh, Harvard Association, um, the Harvard Association test, the implicit association test. I have to like send you guys a link. Um, we have actually, I, we wrote about this in the book, but if you want to learn more about sort of your, your unconscious thinking, and I'll let you know how biases and stereotypes are so ingrained. Since I already told you, you guys know I was raised pregnant. I was my full-time custodian. My parent was a single father. I'm out in the world as a grown woman. You would think that I am slightly biased to think that, you know, when it comes to family, and work, and men, and women, that are pretty, like, equal and or biased towards women at work, men, family. I'm not. I took the implicit association test, and it turns out I am slightly immoderate around my association of women and family and men at work. How could that be for me? How could that be? You want to know why? It's because the whole world is constructed around uh, an invisible set of beliefs and stereotypes about how women should be, you know, going back to, you know, hunter-gatherer. And so, look, the job of every ally, the job of every human, in my opinion, if I could wave my magic wand, I would give everybody some second consciousness to say, whoa, before I react, what, how, what, what kind of thoughts, beliefs, uh, biases, preferences are part of this conclusion that I've just reached, whatever that conclusion is, you know? So it's slowing down our thinking. Which, which, by the way, is super hard in this world today because everything else is asking you to speed your thinking up. Look at this thing, do that, your phone, your notification. Like to slow down in a moment where I'm making a decision about something and try to analyze those biases, massively hard, right? Yeah. Like massively challenging. And look, this going back to arriving and thriving, like, like, I think leaders have to do this now. And the reason why is because if we didn't, if we didn't know it before the pandemic, when empathy first leadership was a, a desire for everyone, we do know it now because we woke up, I don't know, March of 2020. And those of us who are in the knowledge working environment actually started to see the human beings we work with, not just the human resources we work with. And so when we saw the human beings we work with, we had to interact at the human being level. And human beings want to be valued. They want to be cared for. They want to be seen. They want to be um, desired. You know what I mean? And so we see the human beings and their fallibility. And leaders, by and large, 
like, and I put myself in this category, I just like to get stuff done, you know? And so it's all of the human being stuff. Um, we got to bring our people along and show them that we care. Um, and the first way I know how to do that is to Velcro to my best self, right? So I return to my best self when I get triggered and kicked out of my best self so that I can come back to Compassionate Center and meet you in a conversation that might be hard or make amends for something that I said that I didn't mean or, you know, it's that kind of thing. So it's checking in with your thinking is step one. But we also have this cool inclusive leaders playbook and it is available on Amazon. But the last chapter of Arrive and Thrive, you can find that at ArriveandThrive.com. Um, it's on Amazon, et cetera. But the last chapter, we decided to make it about the work of the inclusive leader and all the all our best thinking my best thinking, my co-author's best thinking, and I think probably the most relevant tools and definitions about what you're supposed to do with all this is in that set of practice. So there you go. Okay, let's let's keep walking down here. I I, I think we're, let's skip embracing authenticity for just a second because we're having a pretty authentic discussion here. Um, a culture of courage, was that was that the next one? We want to create a culture of courage? Yeah, it's actually cultivating courage. Cultivating so courage. Courage from the individual level and creating a culture of courage. So what what is what does it look like to cultivate courage? What does it look like to cultivate courage? Um, so, you know, first of all, I was pleased to learn the culture uh, that courage is not the absence of fear. It's the presence of vulnerability, really, right? So uh, in the path to cultivate courage, we need to simply take more risks. Um, and Chad, you you said you were kind of interested in the whole healthy team thing. Um, the healthy team environment uh, research, there's so much research on teams and there's so many books on teams and there's so many thought leaders on teams. Uh, it was the hardest chapter to write. Uh, I was first author on that chapter. And um, what we ended up doing is coming up with our own rubric. It's the only practice chapter that has its own rubric. And by that, I mean, we came up with six, six actions that matter most when it comes to creating healthy teams. And I want to talk about the sixth one because I'm sure you guys have heard of it, but a lot of people say it and don't know what it means. Um, the sixth one is psychological safety, creating psychological safety. And it ties directly to what we were just talking about in terms of how to be a better ally. What am I supposed to do when I wake up white male? It is creating an environment where people can make mistakes and feel safe enough to speak up, to offer ideas, and they're not going to be blamed or shamed, right? Um, and so having an environment of psychological safety, it's like the other five actions uh, for creating healthy teams don't work very well if there's not psychological safety. So these these themes kind of go in and it's, it's really hard to create psychological safety if you're not modeling courage, courageous acts, or you're not coming across as your genuine, authentic self, so the practices start to, you'll see the reinforcement of them with each other. So we can talk more about courage if you want. We can talk about any of it. I'm all right. I, we'd love to dive into you, folks. Get the book, right? I mean, <laughs> we're, 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 we don't want to have this podcast become 90 minutes. I mean, I listened to a 90 minute podcast. Uh, not too long ago. And I was like, why? Why? I mean, that just, I, I, right? We don't go that long. We intentionally don't. So we're not going to be able to dive into each of the seven deeply like we might with some other authors. And I think that's because this conversation took a left turn and said, let's dive into this topic to help all of us out there. And uh, here's the thing. I, here's what I want to know from you. Uh, well, I want to know a bunch of things. I mean, a conversation just came to my head. I, I'm a coach. This is what I do full time. And I, I probably coach about 50% women, 50% men in, in business, life, whatever the concept is that I'm coaching them on. And one recently did not join me as a coaching client because they wanted a woman. They didn't even give me the chance to enter. They wanted a woman because they thought a woman was more relational and would be a better, right? So it's, I almost feel like, wait a minute, you just put me in the exact position that said, because I'm a man, I, you, you're having, right? So... I'm, now I'm just all annoyed on every level today, and I'm going to be fired <laughs> up. To so watch out for me, everybody. Yeah, uh, Chad's next coaching client when we get off this call. He's going to be yeah. all fired up for you. Look out for that person. Here's what I want. You titled the book Arrive and Thrive. Okay. What does it mean to thrive? What does that truly mean to everybody in our audience? 
Uh, so, all right, I'm going to tell you guys a little secret that I'm now it's going to, you know, be known by the, the you hate the title of the book and wanted it to be something else. No, we never, oh, okay. we never define what it means to thrive because, uh, thriving is what you think thriving is. So I'm not going to tell you what scenario of life you're going to feel like meets your thriving. I think it's a subjective consequence of the choices you make about... Well, so, you know what's funny? For a lot of us, I'll bet, the deeply held belief, we have a deeply held belief about what it even means to thrive and we should probably be like checking the box right. us anymore. Yeah. yeah. And here's the good news. I thought this was like, this kept showing up in the research, uh, specifically around authenticity, which I really was surprised by. Because I do, I do executive coaching too, Chad, and I was, I was really surprised that our authenticity changes over time, just like our definition of what it means to thrive changes over time, just like our concoction for well-being. Part of this, I have to tell you, part of what I'm dishing out to you actually came from a male ally of mine, Dr. Rich Zafir, who I interviewed for the book. Um, and he's the chief well-being officer at Johns Hopkins. And I got on the phone with Rich and I'm like, Rich. And I had my like notebook poise. I was ready to take my notes on like the five top things I need to do in order to experience well-being in my life. And I mean, I was ready to tackle it, right? Uh, and he said, Susan, well-being means for you whatever you choose well-being to me. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, three times a week lifting weights and like at least this much cardio and drinking this much water. Like it might not have anything to do with my physical health right now at this stage of the game. It might be relationally. It might be financially. It might be anything I need, you know? Um, and so it's, it's actually quite the good news about the fact that I'm not defining thriving is that there isn't anything to live up to. The bad news about not defining thriving is there's no recipe. But, and there are practices, right? There are things that can, and this is why I love coaching. There are tools you can grasp that will help you discover as you mature and age and grow and change what thriving means. And I'm saying, you know, I basically say, let's stop surviving. Let's stop, you know, we're in a post pandemic world where, like, if there was ever a moment where we could create the life we want on purpose. I feel like now is that because the, there's so many rules that are sort of thrown up in the air, you know, um, why it's not? It's going to take some courage though. I mean, it is going to take some courage, right? Most of us are, there, there's something we have to step over to get to that life we want. Yeah. We have to get out of our own way a lot. Um, and dare greatly and ask for, ask for things. I think, uh, Yeah. Dare greatly and ask for things? Is that a, a portion dare of that? Dare ask for, ask for, yeah, ask for things that feel like, because what I find with women in particular is that we've already made the reason why whatever it is that we want isn't attainable. And, um, you know, my sell on leadership to women who are, you know, early or mid-career who are like, gosh, you know, going into leadership is just more work. And like, but you have to remember that when you're in a position of power, you can influence the system in a way that actually helps you thrive and more people also thrive. So if there's something that needs to change, if there's a policy or a procedure or a system or even a belief that gets played out in the culture, when you're in a position of leadership, you name it, you call it, you change it, you incentivize differently around it. Like you have the influence, the, the positional influence to do that. Not that you have to wait to get into leadership to make those kinds of uh, changes. It just helps. <laughs> yeah. help. If you're the one when you deciding have the power, whether to make it or not. Yeah. Yeah. When you have the power, it's a little bit easier to make the changes the way you believe they should be made. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm wow. Okay. Uh, uh, it's not often I'm speechless, right? I mean, our audience will know Chad speechless that that rarely happens. Susan, oh, is that a bad thing? That's is that that's a bad thing, right? <laughs> no, it's not a bad thing. It's I just I, I love this discussion. I, I could talk about this for a long time, and I think Absolutely. the reality is, Susan, I, I I'm married to a a, a woman who's uh, Korean, and uh, I, I I didn't think much about any of this kind of stuff before I met my wife. Quite honestly, I just didn't. Um, and it was a blind spot, and and I, we spent the first two years of our relationship, me like, wow, understand. 
I had no idea women walked down the street with their keys between their hands. I just, I, like, I just was totally oblivious, I think, for most of my, you know, that, those early adult years of mine. And so this is a fascinating topic to me. I, I, my wife has, has allowed this, me to see this, to open my eyes, that this is, that these things are happening. And look, I'm, we got a lot of privilege in my life and, and feel very fortunate for it. And um, I think that like our company will be best served when we get a better, more inclusive viewpoint with, with, like you said, more, you know, more identities coming to the table to help us make decisions about what's going to be good for our company. And so I love this discussion. I'd love to have you back and, and dive more into this, but thank you so much. This is, I think, just starting to think about this stuff for a lot of us, you know, thankfully because of my wife, I, I, I've, I've been there a little bit already, but I think we all need to, need to, to be aware right? More than anything? Well, I, yeah. I, I had to, there's a cartoon out there about equity versus equality. And I'll leave you guys with this. So equality is, let's say there's a six foot fence, okay? And um, equality is giving three people of different heights the same stool, because that's equal. I'm going to give you a three, each of you get a three, feet, three foot stool. Um, equity is when you give the person who's five five uh, you know, a six inch stool, the person who's five, eight, a, you know, three inch stool, the person who's six, one, no stool at all. That's equity. Cause we're just trying to get to see over the top of the fence here. Right. So, um, the, the, the hard part about that is it's, it's nuanced, it's individualistic. And so my calling to all leaders, however you identify is to see the human you're working with and, and be wary of making uh, a lot of um, assumptions about them uh, and connect about what they need and want to to give their all. I, I'm out for discretionary effort at work. I've got a team. I'm in an offsite right now, a leadership offsite that's happening in in my in like my where I live. And I left to talk to you guys, and they're going to get so much good work done. I'm like, I don't, I almost don't want to get in their way again. But I have to tell you, what I know is that um, I'm learning more from them these days than than they probably ever are going to learn from me. This is my jam. I like doing this. So thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us, Susan. Look, if anybody listening to this wants to get a hold of the book, obviously arrive and thrive. You can go on Amazon. You can find it. We'll have a link in the show notes. You can go to arriveandthrive.com. Is that what it yep. was? Arriveandthrive.com. And how do they get hold of you if they want to have a follow-up conversation yes, with you or reach out to you? So uh, inclusiveleadership.com and arriveandthrive.com. And now that I've relented to all social, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Now that I'm friends with right, Ryan Reynolds. Now that Ryan Reynolds, <laughs> now that Ryan Reynolds is there, sure. Right? Like, that's an Instagram. <laughs> On your Instagram followers. <laughs> I have a lot more on other platforms, but yeah. Uh, anyway, so thanks again for having me, you guys. I'll you got it. I'll come back and talk to you about any little rabbit hole you want to go down. Oh, we will yeah. make that happen. Folks, her name is Susan Brady. If you want to find more about her, you know, she no relation to Tom, to my belief, yet I'm going to tell you, after this conversation, this woman's the GOAT, right? You want to check this book out. You want to follow... Susan Brady, find out more about her. And folks, let's go make an impact in the world. Let's hear what she shared with us today and let's open our arms, be more inclusive and find out what deeply held beliefs no longer serve you. I love Susan, that. Susan, thanks for joining us here today. Folks, make sure you join our Facebook group, Win, Make, Give. And of course, share this episode with everybody. Until our next one, do good.